Stand Together is proudly sponsored by these International Genetic Solutions Partners. When we collaborate, you profit, achieve results, and build your future with powerful data and informed decisions. Welcome to the International Genetic Solutions Stand Together program. I'm your host, Chip Kim. Today we explore opportunities in the beef on dairy marketplace. What should beef cattle producers consider when targeting genetics for dairy cattle? We'll talk about it all, from genetic selection to end product targets and what ultimately drives profit. With me today is longtime seed stock operator and renowned cattleman, Jerry Wolf. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you for joining us. Um, clearly, you're experience and background and, and, and your entire family's background in the seed stock business is clearly known. But today we're gonna kind of focus in on, on one subset uh, of your life experiences. And I'd like you to, if you would, explain to the audience a little bit about your foray over the last many, many years into the beef on dairy space, how that came about and some of the things you've learned um, over the many years and, and adjustments maybe that you've had to make. Well, thank you, Chip. Um, as you mentioned, we've been in the seed stock business for over four decades now. So a lot of our experience, and, and I might mention too that we were cattle feeders before we were cattle breeders. We're also, uh, about 25 years ago, we entered into the dairy space and got in the dairy business. And the advent of sex semen, being able to get all our dairy replacements by using heifer semen, it then allowed, freed us up half or more of that herd to use a beef bowl on. So, and, and at the same time, we were feeding some dairy steers in our, through our feed yard, some straight dairy steers. And it was just the norm to get discounted. So our goal was to, to use the right beef bowl on them cows and eliminate that discount. So you mentioned how your operation over time, uh, because of the cheese side of the business, you oriented towards a certain sort of cow, right? That's what you needed to do to meet that demand. And so from the dairy standpoint, clearly there are two prominent breeds that impact this. Both are clearly important in the dairy space. Could you kind of set the stage as it were for some of the major differences and maybe the similarities between the implementation of Holstein, cow, Holstein genetics and or Jersey genetics into the beef supply chain? They are a little different. Uh, an average Jersey cow is going to weigh 1,050 to 1,100 pounds. And a Holstein is going to be larger framed and weigh 1,500 plus pounds. So quite a bit of difference, you know. And there's an old rule of thumb that uh, a steer with like kind genetics when he's ready for market, when he's ready for market is when he reaches the mature weight of his mother. Well, that's quite a bit of difference. Yeah. So trying to bring them closer together, we needed to compensate with a bit different genetics for the different type cows. So bigger cow, bigger frame, later maturing, you don't want to use a, a, a bigger frame, later maturing bull, you want to use a smaller frame, early maturing bull on that Holstein cow to bring him back in size. Yep. And a Jersey, just the opposite. You know, as long as we don't have calving difficulty, we want to maximize growth, muscle, and size as much as possible. What are some of the specific carcass components that you needed to make better with your beef bull selection? The straight dairy steers or steer carcasses were being discounted relative to the native beef cattle. Yeah. That discount was happening not because of low quality, mm -hmm. but because of lack of muscle. Those are poor yielding cattle. There's just less muscle on, a, on the frame of a dairy carcass versus a beef carcass. And also I might mention, they have otter shaped, a more narrow shaped uh, ribeye versus a, a rounder or more oval shaped ribeye of a beef carcass. So the number one challenge we thought, and still is today, is to fix that dairy deficiency and add muscle to that dairy cow and put muscle in that carcass. So, and, and it's, it's hard to do that with certain breeds. It's good to have some continental influence. In our case, we use, we use a lot of limousine and lip flex genetics, because those dairy steers at the time we started were being discounted $6 a hundredweight. 
that has since moved to like 10 to 12 dollars a hundred weight mm-hmm. if we can get rid of that gap that was the low-hanging fruit yep. and it took muscle to do that it's still true today many might say well where have the quality grades gone have they continued to progress at the level you need? Do you have the genetic tools to keep those in place or enhance marbling to the level that's important to you? Where have you seen that happen over time? You know, it's amazing. Um, as we've put more product in these cattle and, and have uh, increased ribeye size, we haven't lost quality grain. Yeah, and with the right management from and, and this is very important, as important as genetics, is with the right management from birth to harvest, we can keep the quality in these calves and make a very nice, desirable carcass. What have you seen over time in terms of the variability within your program, the variability of the beef on dairy calf, how has that unified up or maybe shrank the variation as you've evolved in your own business? I mean, I would answer that is you just have to have some methodology. I mean, don't use this to run experiments, you know? Yeah. Figure, yeah. figure out quickly what's the right genetics. Yep. And then in, in, this, in this type of production model, where these calves are all made through AI, artificial insemination, yep. we can, just like that Holstein steer calf used to be cookie cut, we can make cook, more cookie cut cattle or more consistent cattle than even coming out of our typical native population. but. Some, some methodology starting with genetics and then I can't stress enough the management from day one, getting plastrum in that calf, treating that beef calf the same as that dairyman treats his heifer calf, sets him up for lifelong success. What are some of the things that are kind of front of mind for you that you're really striving in your own business model to get better, seek, solve? Our, our list has got a few things on yeah, it, more than one. Yeah. <laughs> and our top priority would be uh, liver liver abscesses and, and condemnations coming from them, okay? Almost positive, not sure, but almost positive that that is diet related. And, and that is where the production system is quite a bit different than native beef cattle. Yeah. These calves don't grow up out on grass following mama around and go out as stalkers. So they spend a lot of days on feed, and I believe we're gonna be able to, to fix that with, with focus and strategy uh, through nutrition. You know, it might take a little time. And then the other challenge, which is an, is, is an exciting challenge, is just, you, you know, that we're excited about is just the opportunity to capture such high volumes of, of data back health data, feedlot performance data, carcass data of known genetics yep. since these cattle yep. are made through AI, artificial insemination, that now the beef industry has access to a large commercial data bank to, to feed back to genetics that we have been craving or haven't had for the last half a century, right? Yeah. If these beef dairy cross cattle stay healthier, their beef counterparts will be healthier. If they convert feed better, their beef counterparts, genetic, with, with like-kind genetics on the beef side, will convert better. Same with carcass. We can use this data to make better beef genetics, make larger strides and improvement going forward. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. We'll continue our Beef on Dairy conversation after this. IGS Stand Together is brought to you by these IGS sponsors. North American Limousine Foundation. Do more with less with Limousine. Incorporate Limousine and LimFlex genetics into your program to capitalize on the breed's feed efficiency while earning carcass premiums. Limousine today, profit tomorrow. The American Simmental Association. For genetics that pay, turn to Simmental. The numbers show Simmental and Simmental influenced calves earn more from packers and auction buyers while offering more efficient females. Stand strong with Simmental. If you think about really IGS from a big picture standpoint, it's the value of collaboration and beef breeds historically haven't always worked together so well or so much, but IGS kind of broke the mold on that and being able to combine these data sets, more analytical power, better EPD predictions to use for all the breeds involved, IGS really facilitates that in an unprecedented way. 
when you've got this many cattle in the evaluation, now with single step genomics and the money the seed stock producer spends on testing cattle for the 17, 18 traits we track, what you get is crossbreed cattle evaluations that the commercial cattleman can use when he's looking at EPD traits now. They're on an equal basis on all these various breeds. So in the race to make the better kind of cattle, the science we're using today, I think it's on the forefront of getting really exciting. Welcome back to the IGS Stand Together. Joining me for more of the Beef on Dairy conversation is a meat scientist from Washington State University. Welcome to Dr. Blake Forker. Dr. Thanks. Blake Forker, thank you so very, very much for being here. Thanks for having me, Chip. What at such an early point in your career has positioned you so prominently in the beef on dairy space? Well, it, it really all started back in 2019 uh, as I began my doctoral work at Texas Tech University. And uh, I was working with my major professor at the time, Dr. Dale Warner, uh, just took a position at Texas Tech. And then an incredible team of not only other graduate students and colleagues, but uh, other faculty uh, within that program. And so I would say that we were some of the early adopters of the academic research on beef on dairy at the time. And of course, as you know, uh, that, that time period between 2015 to 2018 saw very rapid expansion um, in dairies adopting the beef on dairy practice. And so as a result of, of a need in the industry to understand more about beef on dairy and how that was influencing our feedlots, our packers, and, and ultimately our consumers of beef, uh, we decided to, to outline multiple different research projects. And, and that's what I spent all of my dissertation work on from 2019 up until uh, this past spring, 2022. Those metrics, a lot of folks might in, uh, interpret what you're saying to mean that um, there are a lot more dairy influenced animals going into the supply chain than there used to be, but that may not exactly be the case, right? That's exactly right, Chip. So we have 10 million dairy cows, let's just say a, a split 50-50 ratio of males versus female calves born, one calf born per cow per year. So in general, and that, that 10 million cow number, by the way, has, st has remained steady for the past let's say 20 years within the United States. So if we're producing, using that split ratio of female to male calves, we're producing 5 million male dairy calves in the U.S. industry for the, let's say the past 20 years. And we understand outside of the exception of keeping a few bulls back to, to collect semen from in the dairy industry, most of those male calves have been entering the terminal beef supply chain. So fast forward then to the past five to three years, We've just transitioned the consist of those 5 million terminally influenced male dairy calves towards beef on dairy calves. And so we're really just replacing the consist of the straight bred Holstein that's entering the fed beef supply chain, replacing that animal with a beef on dairy composite. And so in general today, if we say that you know, there were, were 5 million dairy influenced cattle entering the fed beef supply chain, I would venture to guess that approximately three and a half million of those in this year uh, will be harvested as beef on dairy composites. Let's talk about what's happening on the ground in the feedlot and with the packer as we speak. Yes, yeah, so let's just imagine the landscape of, of many of these feed yards and realize that it, it kind of took a special program to feed the Holstein, the traditional Holstein that was entering our fed beef supply chain, say 20 years ago. And so you saw many feed yards exclusively source and feed Holsteins. Now today, you no longer see those feed yards with the black and white landscape. They very much transitioned to, in general, the black hided uh, beef on dairy cross. And, and, and I think there's, there's huge implications for that, that I think we need, while well, there's some challenges with beef on dairy that I think we'll talk about here in a bit, I think from the outside looking in, there's a, a huge sustainability advantage to now feeding this beef on dairy cross and using beef genetics uh, because those genetics have been selected for the terminal beef supply chain. Um, and then using those genetics on dairy cows has really realized some efficiencies in the feed yards sector. Because any time that we can keep cattle on feed for, for fewer number of days, um, and that's specifically the case with beef on dairy in comparison to Holstein, we have major sustainability and environmental footprint implications for that. So not only are we keeping these animals around for a shorter amount of time, 
but those animals while they're in the yard are also more feed efficient. They're converting feed uh, and, and gaining better. Um, and then we'll talk about their carcasses. Not only are they still maintaining the, the grade potential that dairy influence genetics have been traditionally known for in our industry, but those carcasses are of a much better muscling conformation and we get a much greater yield out of those beef on dairy carcasses in general in comparison to the Holstein. So I think the fact of the matter is from a terminal beef perspective, both at the feed yard and at the packer sector, beef on dairy is a, a much more efficient model than, uh, than the straight bred dairy uh, animal that we saw entering our fed beef supply chain, say 20 years ago. You talked about uh, the ability to grade, the, the rich meated, high marbling kind of cattle. What are some of the other uh, challenges that they might face from a carcass perspective? Well, I think any time that we influence uh, or, or interject more inferiorly muscled genetics, particularly from the dairy side, there's always concern about conversion of live weight to carcass weight. And so let's start there with dressing percentage. And so in general, if we were to average across all of the beef on dairies, because of a lack of muscling in, in many of those cattle that perhaps haven't been strategically selected for terminal traits, or, or in other words, if dairies haven't placed a lot of emphasis on, let's say, premium beef semen, we would generally have a lower dressing percentage uh, within those carcasses. And so I think then the, uh, that, that takes me to my next point, because we realize that muscling, not only is it a, a primary contributor to dressing percentage, that conversion of live weight to carcass weight, but it's also a, a primary determinant of, of total carcass yield. And so what we've noticed in the, my research is that there's a, a wide variability in the composition of these carcass and primarily as a result of conformation. In other words, what we'd like to term good ones versus bad ones. And so those that have the dairy type muscling, the very inferior triangular shape round versus those that perhaps have been selected for beef type traits and you really can't tell their carcass uh, apart from a, a traditional beef type carcass in the packing plant. So those would be probably some, some two primary challenges. I'd say some other things that we need to consider there uh, would be liver abscesses and of course that's not just a hot topic with dairy influenced cattle but that's a hot topic I think across our entire beef industry uh, that we need to consider. What are the beef breeds that seem to be the most prevalent in the beef on dairy space? I guess my challenge to dairies is because they can be selective with the semen that they are using on their dairy cows is choose the, the best sire for that situation regardless of that breed. And, and yes, there, there would be some consideration is, to, is that sire going to make my calves black um, that needs to go into that decision. But they need to look at the, the whole gamut of, of traits, if you will, um, to make that best decision for their operation. So I hear you say maybe that the trend is to include a little bit of continental genetics, maybe the straight British, um, in some places makes a lot of sense, but maybe in certain applications, straight British sires may not be the full answer in every, in every situation. That's exactly right. I mean, as we you know, historically look back at the breeds, the, the more terminal type breeds would a shot more muscle and a shot more growth that would be important uh, in consideration with the, the dairy genetics. But I think it's also important to note that there's been enough uh, genetic selection and, and progress and even some of these British type breeds that they've been able to trend away than, than, from perhaps their, their stereotype of uh, being smaller framed and slower growing. And so I, again, I, I just go back to it's, it's really consideration of the individual sire and, and their genetic potential to influence uh, to traits that, that are important in the beef on dairy mating. Dr. Blake does a great job of, of setting the table for us. We're going to dig into two or three very specific research areas that his team is interested in and where we think this is headed down the road. We're going to get his take on that in just a moment. Don't go too far. We'll be right back. IGS Stand Together is made possible by these sponsors. The American Gelvie Association. Gelvie and Balancer Genetics offer increased fertility, longevity in pounds, as well as gain, grade, and value in the feed yard. Gelvie and Balancer, the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. Everybody wants data and it's at your fingertips. It's important to use all the tools available from IGS, both feeder profit calculator as well as the EPDs that are coming out of the evaluation to make decisions both efficiently and effectively. With technology rapidly evolving, it's important that we're using those to make better cattle and ultimately a better beef industry. But it's important at the end of the day that we all work towards that common goal of being the protein of choice on the plate so we can survive well into the future. The beauty of IGS is it makes commercial cattlemen and cattlewomen more powerful when they're making decisions to get past all of the 
the clutter and the minutia math to make smarter, wiser, more profit-focused decisions. It, and it can't be duplicated. We're a lot stronger working together than we are individually. We're getting a lot better genetic predictions by doing what we're doing, working together. And so that's really the power of IGS. Welcome back to IGS's Stand Together. I'm back with Dr. Blake Borker of Washington State University to continue our conversation on beef on dairy, genetics, its market impacts, and the latest research. First, the size and scale of a Holstein female is something that most of us know. Even most cowboys who work in a different sector can recall, she's a pretty big creature. And so something that we never really think about in the traditional beef space is carcass length. But sometimes in the packing plant and these beef on dairy cattle, that can be a bit of a, a situation. Describe what happens there, why it's even a concern. Should we be looking to do something about it? The reason and the challenge for uh, of, of carcass length in some of these packing plants is just fi primarily physical, right? That essentially these rails uh, of, of plants built in the 70s and 80s that were accommodating carcass weights that were perhaps you know, 60 to 70 percent of the carcass weights and carcass sizes that we have today in our beef industry um, you know, certainly can't accommodate the really, really large scale Holsteins. And so you know, there were many different thresholds at the time that were established for hip height because we you know, decided that perhaps there was a correlation between hip height and carcass length and was the major challenge for Holsteins. And, and it's the, the constraint once those, those cattle get onto the harvest floor at many of these packing plants uh, that slows the chain speed down. And we also know that, that time is money, right? Especially in the, the beef packing sector. And so that's the challenge with, with carcass length. Well, other last thing that I would throw in there uh, somewhat associated with carcass length is on the live side, generally those animals that are, are really tall at the hip could in fact uh, encounter some bruising in the leading and unloading of the truck. And so uh, in those instances of severe bruising, that would result in major trim loss and major product loss uh, within those carcasses in high value cuts, because that bruising is generally occurring over the loin and sirloin. And so if we have to convert a strip loin from a, a number one to a number two, that's major value lost uh, because of bruise and because of extra carcass uh, length and, and hip height. So it's interesting, you, you touched on that last piece. The bruising issue is probably something that most of us cowboys don't even think about, but I think we're gonna see very clearly in the next beef quality audit when it comes out that, that bruising has magnified itself in terms of importance. And so, um, interesting point, and I'm glad you bring that up. And, and let me throw in one last thing there. Perhaps I, I didn't directly answer your question of the beef on dairy and how, how it, what its influence is on, on carcass length. One thing I would say there is the, the half shot of beef that we put in these beef on dairies, by and large has really mitigated the problem of carcass length. And so I would say because we're moderating this, the frame size of those beef on dairy crosses to a, a much more considerable magnitude, it's just a much more manageable frame size, um, you know, it, it, which bodes to the fact that those animals are more efficient in the feedlot and, and just their type and kind. And so really we would say by and large today, beef on dairy has a, a really mitigated the issue of carcass length associated with dairy influenced cattle. Going into the concept of serious concerns or research issues in the space, I know one of the things that you and Dr. Warner and the entire team that you've worked with in the past, one of the areas that you all have really done a deep dive on and frankly are out in front of almost everybody in the business on this particular place is trying to understand this challenge of muscle composition in the dairy influenced creature. Is ribeye a worthy proxy? There was a study done on Brahmin crosses that actually demonstrated that not only were there differences between animals with different composition of Brahmin breeding um, crossed with Hereford, but even within those animals that had the same composition of Brahmin and Hereford breeding, there were differences in eating quality that could be attributed to the visual phenotype of those animals. And so we wondered that since we saw differences between, let's say, dairy type versus beef type uh, on, as a result of straight bred Holstein versus, let's say, straight bred Angus, while there were large differences in morphology and body shape in the form of hip height and body depth and shoulder height, even at equal weights, there was no difference in ribeye area. And so, and there, by the way, there was also differences, once we hung those carcasses up, large differences in round conformation. In that study, we noted that, that really ribeye area contributed very little to differentiating the, the differences in muscling, particularly in the form of round conformation of those cattle. And so the next study that we designed was to evaluate differences in, in cattle type 
uh, namely Holstein versus beef on dairy uh, versus conventional beef cattle. And we took those beef on dairies and we split them into what we'd consider good ones versus bad ones from a yield standpoint. So those high yielding ones versus the low yielding ones. And we, we did conduct a red meat yield test. And so we broke those carcasses down, fabricated them into subprimals, and then compared what percentage of that carcass was comprised in a saleable form or a high value form um, in, in the case of subprimals. And so within that study, we noted that actually high yielding beef on dairy crosses can yield just as much, if not more, saleable lean than the average conventional beef type animal. Help me understand the problem with liver abscesses in the beef on dairy space. Cowboys, we just don't talk about this terribly often. It's perhaps more pronounced in the dairy influenced uh, side of things because we're putting those cattle on feed generally at a much younger age and we're feeding those cattle for a much greater proportion of their lifetime on that high concentrate diet. And so that's where you know, in Holsteins we would see liver abscess rates of you know, 60 to 80 percent um, of a lot would have a liver abscess and, and there's actually some beef on dairy lots that have comparable numbers. but. There's a lot of different environmental factors that influence that as well that we perhaps don't have a, a great grasp on. But the one thing, Chip, that I want to make a note of here is it's really not the liver abscess itself that causes the, the value discount at the packer. And I, that's not really the reason why, why packers are discounting primarily these dairy influenced cattle, whether they be straight red Holstein or beef on dairy. It's really the influence of that liver abscess on uh, uh, other things like the outside skirt meat, which in fact in, in 2021, outside skirt meat was the second most valuable cut in the carcass on a per pound basis, second only to the tenderloin. And so I don't think that a lot of people recognize that, but in the, the incidents where the liver is severely abscessed, it will actually adhere to that outside skirt muscle and then those uh, gutters on the gut table will actually have to trim out that outside skirt muscle in those severe instances. And so that's a major value loss up to 50 to $60 per head, uh, not to mention the fact that the, the packers are having to slow down the chain speed in order to accommodate the trimming of that, that outside skirt. Thank you again, Dr. Foraker. Greatly appreciate your wisdom. We appreciate Jerry Wolf as well as he joined us in this episode. And thank you all for joining us. And as always, you can learn more about the topics discussed today at internationalgeneticsolutions.com. We've come together, I've put together just this massive collaborative effort with approaching 20 million head of cattle to provide the most scientifically credible, the most cost-effective, the quickest, multi-breed, directly comparable genetic evaluation on the planet. So now instead of benefiting uh, from only uh, data, for instance, collected by Simmental breeders, those same Simmental breeders now benefit from data collected by Red Angus breeders or from limousine breeders or Gelby breeders and the list goes on.